How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here once again. This time we're going to take a look at strengths of covalent bonds. So our objectives will be to describe bond strength in terms of bond enthalpy and describe factors that affect bond enthalpy. So first question, well, what are bonds? A little review. Two atoms that are stuck together because of how their electrons interact, right? We can have electrons being transferred from one atom to another, kind of like in ionic bonding, the sodium is losing its valence electron and giving it to chlorine, making chlorine negative and sodium positive. And then we have an ionic bond holding those guys together. Or both atoms can share some of their electrons with each other. Like in HCl, well, hydrogen's going, hey, I'll put in one of my electrons. If chlorine, you put in one of your electrons and then we'll share them and we make a bond that way, right? So there, so how strong are these bonds then? Well, the strength of bond is pretty much just talking about how difficult it is to break those atoms apart. So how difficult would it be to rip this hydrogen away from this chlorine? That's going to be what we're talking about when we're talking about bond strength. So how much energy do we got to invest to separate two, those two things? Think about like having two magnets stuck together. They're bonded together. How much energy do we got to put into separating them? Or if something was glued together, how much energy are you going to have to put in to break it apart? That's what we're talking about with the strength of a bond. And that amount of energy we call bond enthalpies because it's, you know, enthalpies we're talking about energy. And it's for the bond. So how much energy we've got to put in to put in to break that bond. And these are always positive. These are always positive values. It takes energy to break things apart. Remember that. All right, CH4 breaking up. Let's talk about an example. If I'm talking about breaking CH4, which is just one carbon bonded to these four hydrogens, and I wanted to break them apart so that I get carbon all by itself and all these hydrogens by themselves, I have to put in 1660 kilojoules, 1660 kilojoules. So to break those four bonds, that's how much energy I got to put in. So if I'm talking about bond enthalpy for just one of those bonds, this carbon hydrogen bond, I take the total energy that it took to break it four of those bonds, divide it by four, and it tells me that the bond enthalpy for carbon hydrogen bond is 415 kilojoules per mole. So if I have carbon bonded to a hydrogen, I gotta put in 415 kilojoules to break that bond apart. Factors affecting bond strength. Well, what elements are bonding together determines, you know, the, it's like the number one go-to question is, all right, well, what's it bonded to if we wanna talk about bond strength? So hydrogen being bonded to carbon has a different bond enthalpy than hydrogen bonding to a fluorine. So you can see right here, carbon hydrogen bond enthalpy is roughly 415 kilojoules per mole, per mole, sorry. And if I take a look at HF, well, how much is that bond? That it's still hydrogen, but it's bonded to something else, and we have a different bond enthalpy. So first factor that's going to affect bond strength is what atoms are bonding to each other. Next is the bond type. Are we talking about a single, double, or triple bond? Well, single bonds are the longest bond, and they're the easiest to break. They have the, you know, between single, double, and triple, they have the least shared common electron, so it's going to be easier to break them apart. Double bonds are going to be the in-between bond, and the triple bond is going to be the shortest bond, and it's going to be the hardest one to break. They're sharing six electrons. It's bonded a bunch of times together over here. And if we take a look experimentally, we see this. Single bonds have bond enthalpy between carbon at 348 kilojoules per mole. Double, more than that, is 614 kilojoules per mole. And for triple bonds, it's the most. It's 839 kilojoules per mole. And if we take a look at the bond lengths, you see a correlation. The tighter that they are held together, the shorter the distance, the harder it is to break them apart. They're, they've bonded more. You can think of it that way. All right, other things. The structure of the rest of the molecule, you may not think about how, you know, well, I'm just interested in this hydrogen Oxygen bond, maybe, and I, you know, is it, it should be the same in all molecules, but that's not true. The structure and what's going on in the rest of the molecule may affect the particular bond strength. So if we take a look at instances where resonance occurs, that may affect the bond enthalpy, or if there's polar bonds somewhere else in the molecule, that may affect the bond enthalpy. So right here, in these examples, we have resonance on the example on the, uh, the left, but we have resonance after the hydrogen is gone. So breaking that bond is a little easier because it's stable or it's more stabilized than it is in this molecule where once we break this bond, there is no resonance. So what's going on in the rest of the molecule does affect the bond enthalpy. So short answer to how strong are the bonds? Well, it varies, right? So the bond strength varies between different molecules, but it's usually only a slight difference.
as a result, we use average bond enthalpies. Whenever we're doing like the work and we're talking about quantifying this with numbers, we use an average bond enthalpy. And this is just something that you're going to look up in a chart somewhere. This isn't information that you need to memorize at all. It's going to look like this. You have what kind of bond you're talking about on, in one column, and then you have the average bond enthalpies in another column. And you just look up which ones you're interested in. It's found on a chart. That's it. You don't got to memorize any of this. A pet peeve. All right. Sometimes I got to rant. All right. Donnie, you rant. Pet peeve from biology. I really hate when biology teachers say this. They sometimes, some of them say energy is released when bonds are broken. Or they say something like energy is stored in chemical bonds whenever they're talking about like food and cellular respiration. But that's just flat out wrong. All right. I, I, it drives me nuts. It's like when people say, oh, glass is a super cool liquid. No, it isn't. All right. This is wrong. Energy is always absorbed to break a bond. Always. If you want to break things apart, you got to put in some energy. The opposite process releases energy. If you're making new bonds, energy is released. And if you're talking about like cellular respiration, well, sometimes the energy being released by the new bonds is more energy than you had to invest to break all the old bonds. So overall, energy is being given off. But that's not always true. Sometimes you got to invest more energy to break those bonds than you get out when you make new bonds. Overall, their energy is absorbed and it's endothermic. Why aren't biology teachers explaining this correctly? Well, my guess is it's easier to say respiration releases energy because energy is stored in chemical bonds than actually explaining all of the details and nuances that are actually going on. It's definitely just easier to say it that way. And for biology, that's I'm sure that's fine for, you know, you're not going to get anything wrong, but it, it is, it's wrong. And I, it drives me crazy. It drives me nuts. All right, so to summarize, bond enthalpy is the energy required to break a bond. It varies slightly based on a few factors, so we use an average. Energy is invested to break bonds and released when new bonds are made. And biology teachers, they may have been lying too. Don't trust them. All right, well, I hope you found that helpful. See you in class. Okay, bye.